And everybody should be able to see this, this screen, right? This PowerPoint screen, everybody can see that. Okay. So where we had left off last week was we had talked about these two kind of um, interrelated issues of collaborative empiricism and guided discovery, right? where we're going to be making sure that we are working with the families, right? Not on them. We're working with them together as a team. And while we're doing that, we're maintaining that kind of data-driven empirical approach of CBT of testing our hypotheses, which are, you know, I think this intervention will cause this change in whatever symptom or problem we're talking about. We also talked a little bit about how this empiricism really makes treatment much less mysterious. Um, it makes it very transparent. You know, I'm telling you why I'm doing what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, and in the order that we're doing these things, right? Um, because my, you know, my ultimate goal as a therapist <laughs> is that I'm teaching you how to be your own therapist, right? I'm teaching the kids how to be their own therapist and teach the parents how to be the kids' therapists, right? To be able to handle any problems that come back up in terms of the behavior that we're talking about. And then we also talked about this idea of kind of guided discovery, right? Where we're, you know, we're just kind of keeping this open mind, right? Um, where I'm not just saying, hey, you know, let's just have me tell you why you're wrong and what you're doing or what you're thinking. It's so, okay, well, you know what, let's, um, let's just maybe cast some doubt on that. Let's help you test it. Let's see if it's true or not, as opposed to me just telling you it's not true. And so these are really underlying kind of core principles that flow throughout whatever kind of cognitive behavioral therapy that you're doing, whether you're working with a two-year-old with, you know, oppositional behavior or, a 16 year old with OCD or whatever else it is that we're talking about. So one of the other things that we need to kind of pay attention to and be mindful of is that one of the aspects that of this kind of flexing and flexibility of CBT is knowing where I am in terms of the stages of therapy and being able to tailor my interventions or even just the speed of my interventions to that particular stage that someone is in. Um, so whether we're at the beginning, whether we're you know, well established, whether we do or don't have a great relationship yet, uh, or good rapport, whether we have a lot of time to work on it versus there's a really big time crunch to address this problem. These are all things that kind of change what level of collaborative empiricism and what level of guided discovery I'm going to be interacting or engaging. These also flex and change based on what the actual problem is, uh, what the developmental level of someone is, uh, how motivated they are to change, various kinds of cultural factors that can, can you know, impact this. So, you know, again, I don't treat everyone the exact same way just because they could have the same potential diagnosis. So, you know, we would all love to have this uh, very high collaboration, high guided discovery relationship, but that's just not possible with everyone. So, for example, people who are very early in treatment are collaboration tends to be lower. Why? Well, because we're still developing that rapport and developing that relationship. When we have much younger children, we tend to have lower collaboration with them and more focused on the parents. Same thing, excuse me, if someone has, uh, you know, a, a big developmental impact where their intellectual functioning is, uh, is impacted negatively in some way, I may not have as much collaboration or guided discovery with them, or I may have to take it more slowly. But I can still do great behavioral work and great cognitive work, even, although I have to adjust it a little bit. Um, those children who are older, more highly motivated, 
I can usually establish my rapport and, and really solidify that collaborative relationship more quickly. Uh, and we see that same thing later in treatment, even for those who are younger or you know, more resistant to, uh, to treatment or to change. By three, four, five, six sessions in, you're usually going to have a much stronger relationship. So it's not that everyone gets the exact same level. Right? Just like everyone doesn't get the exact same treatment, even if they have the same diagnosis, because they have cultural factors, familial factors, developmental factors, presenting problems that are comorbid that help us flex CBT in this way. In order to, again, make it a very personalized, very individualized treatment that's still based on those empirical aspects. So where I'm trying to determine, you know, what level of collaboration am I going to engage in? How much guided discovery am I doing? You got to think about where am I at in therapy? Is this my first meeting with this, this family? Or do we have a well-established relationship? Um, what are the particular strengths or particular uh, you know, vulnerabilities that this child or this adolescent uh, is presenting with? So I'll give you guys a, uh, an example. So I'm working with two you know, younger children right now, one's 11 and one's six. Um, the 11 year old has the mental capabilities of about the six year old, right? They're completely different families. Um, but she has a very, very, the 11 year old has a very, very low amount of uh, introspection and a very low amount of ability to communicate what's going on internally. So both in terms of cognitions as well as uh, emotional states. And that's something we've been working on for two months at this point. Uh, and she really is struggling with it. And she's really, you know, how are you doing today? Fine. Oh, okay. Well, because you, based on your parents' report, had a terrible day, right? Like, like the things did not go well today. Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Right? Whereas the six-year-old, uh, who I'm seeing, you know, for similar anxiety-related problems, is like, all right, Dr. Caleb, let me tell you all about all the thoughts that I had today, right? And she's just like, boom. Um, here's why I got scared. It's because this dream I had last night, and here's what happened. And then this thing in the shadows reminded me of that dream, right? She's just very highly verbal, very introspective, very aware of her own thoughts and emotions. And so, you know, I approach those in very, very different ways. Um, I'm working with the parents uh, a lot in both of them, but I'm actually working with the parents almost exclusively with this 11 year old. Right? I'll see the kid just to maintain a little bit of collaboration and rapport for maybe like three to five minutes every session. For the six year old, I'll see them for about 15 minutes. Even though developmentally, um, you know, in most cases, I would see the 11 year old for a much longer portion of the session. So, you know, understanding kind of what's going on there with the individual child and what's going on there with their problems. Um, so, for, you know, this little six year old, their main presenting problem they showed up with was sleep and sleep issues, where she really was having a hard time falling asleep, getting up in the middle of the night, waking up early. Presenting problems for this 11 year old were uh, vomiting three to five times per week at school in order to be sent home from school. Um, trichotillomania to the point where she has no eyebrows, eyelashes, uh, she had a major strip of hair gone all the way around here, um, as well as no pubic hair. Um, and so, you know, one of those like, yeah, not getting sleep is or having impaired sleep is, is problematic. But this other one of, oh boy, right, this is really bad. Like, this is really, really problematic. Um, meant, hey, we're gonna see you a couple times per week for a couple of weeks in order to get everything kind of you know, uh, 
settle down <laughs> and get a good plan in place. Whereas this other one is like, okay, well, I think meeting once a week is going to be okay for now. Here's what we can do. Here's how we can move forward. But then also interpersonal style is a huge one, right? I've had uh, kids that I've worked with who, you know, have literally asked me to move in with them and their families, right? They're just these like caring, you know, open-hearted people. You can come live with us. Well, I've got a family of my own. Well, they can come too, you know, sort of thing. And just so open about it. Then I have other kids who, you know, when I would go into their homes um, and I'm there to work with them, they just like give me the worst stink eye possible. And they're like, that bastard is here again in my house and he's going to make me uncomfortable, right? Uh, and they did not like me at all at first. They liked me later. Um, and just kind of knowing like some of these kids are going to be more wanting to interact and open to interacting and others are going to be more standoffish or going to be you know, needing a little bit more uh, rapport building. And then we also have to think about these cultural variables that can impact um, how comfortable both the patient or the identified patient and the family is with these ideas of collaborative empiricism and guided discovery. You know, what's the role of authority figures in this culture? Um, What's the role of mental health, right? How is mental health talked about or not? Is it seen as you know, a taboo issue or something that is perfectly fine to address and discuss? Um, you know, there's all these things where, you know, I've had some of my families that I've worked with um, who come from a, a Middle Eastern Islamic uh, Muslim background who they're just like, all right, you tell us what to do, and we'll make sure they do it. <laughs> right? It's like, no, like I don't, I, no, 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 no. We we're we're wanting your advice. You just tell us what to do. Right? And I, you know, I worked on building rapport and stuff, but it was more just, hey, nope, just give it to me. Right? Just tell me what it is, straight up. We'll take care of it. Um, and then I've had other families that I worked with who I really needed to be more joining, right? And I needed to spend a lot of time with that family to address what it was with you know, their reluctance to talk about mental health in their particular cultural background or how they viewed someone else coming in, right? Or I could even have cultural differences between family members, right? Where one parent, for example, would be like, come on in, please get in here, get in here. And the other family member or the other parent was like, what the hell is this guy doing? And like, this is not, I don't like. Um, so, you know, keeping those sort of things in mind are very important when you're trying to, to work on your treatment plan and work on, you know, building that relationship up. So that's kind of what I have about collaborative empiricism and guided discovery. So questions, thoughts, feedbacks based on what we talked about. Body. I have a question. It kind of comes from the video, and I kind of wrote about it in my in my sure. critique. Um, he mentioned that you know we kind of, that you kind of want to steer clear of children that might have cognitive delays. Um, and I I know there are children that do have cognitive delays that are perfectly capable of going through CBT. So I wanted to know if it was like a hard and fast rule, or is it does it depend on the person? Type of thing. So I, think, I think about half of you actually wrote about that in your video reviews <laughs> and mentioned that. So that's a little bit of an older video. So definitely at the time that video was formed, um, there was a lot more reluctance to try and engage with folks who had either just lower developmental uh, abilities or developmental delays of some kind or um, you know impaired intelligence in some fashion. Um, what we know today now from research is, again, how flexible uh, CBT can be with these various populations. So uh, I have good friends, for example, who have run large uh, NIH funded grants treating anxiety using CBT in autistic populations, for example, um, and having wonderful results, but you just have to shift 
what you do, right? So um, you go a little slower <laughs> and have more repetitions of some of the cognitive elements. Um, you place less of an emphasis on uh, what we would call the uh, more rationalizing or uh, kind of higher level cognitive restructuring. Less emphasis on that, more emphasis on what we call an inelegant strategy of here's the thing I say to myself when I feel this way. Um, so you certainly can work with you know, a wide, wide variety of these problems, which is important because we know that a lot of, for example, autistic and intellectually deficient populations struggle with anxiety and depression and other problems that you know we would see across the spectrum of functioning. Uh, so we certainly can work with those. Now, in a lot of those populations, there's more of an emphasis on the B part, right, on the behavioral part, than there is necessarily on the cognitive or the emotional part. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no emphasis on those things. So, yeah, good question, good question. Like I said, a number of you kind of picked that up, because it is definitely a little bit of an older video uh, before a lot of our, our research and, and work on What else? What else? Either from the video or or from, from the lecture. Everybody feeling okay? I had a question okay. about assent versus consent. Older children still need the parents' consent for treatment. Um, and there may be situations where you know, we can't disclose everything we're talking about with the, uh, an adolescent. They may not want their parents to know. Uh, so are we really just kind of asking for the parents' trust in that situation? You, you should trust us. We, we know what we're doing. Yeah, so great question, Zach. So, because um, you cut out a little bit there, so I'm going to restate it just so that everybody can hear. But um, Zach was kind of asking about this idea of assent, consent, and confidentiality when you're working with children and adolescents, um, which they touched on in that first video a little bit. So, you know, consent is you know, more of our legal term, right? So if they're uh, under 18, we have to have the parents' consent to treat them, right? Um, the children, on the other hand, so children and adolescents can assent to treatment, which we often want to try and do as well, but it's not legally binding, right? So I can still do treatment with a two-year-old, even though they're like, I don't want to be here, uh, because their parents are the ones who have the legal consent. Um, now, I always do my best to get assent from kids, um, even really young kids. And I explain that more in terms of, again, developmentally appropriate ways, uh, in terms of, you know, I'm going to work with you but I'm going to need your cooperation. Like we're going to work together in order to help make feel better or to help, you know, make less fighting at home or whatever the problem is. Um, now the confidentiality aspect of that uh, is, is a little more tricky, um, especially with older you know, adolescents. Because, you know, like Zach had said, a lot of times, Adolescents are going to tell you things that they probably don't tell their parents. Um, so I've got numerous supervisees who are working out there in the schools right now uh, who have patients who are clients who are uh, gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual, and they haven't come out to that or parents about that, but they've told the therapist about it, which puts you in a, a tricky position, right? Um, because legally speaking, the parents have access to all those records, right? Um, what I tend to do is I tell my parents and you know, my adolescents or the youth that I'm working with that confidentiality applies to everything that's said in here, right? So I go over our confidentiality. Um, but, you know, you as the parents do have legal rights to look at, you know, the, the records of your kid or to ask me questions. But I also have the right to reserve and say, well, 
you know, that's not something that I think is really important for you to know in terms of therapy. Or that's something that, you know, if I answer it, it's probably going to negatively impact my ability to work well with the child. So if I have a child that discloses, uh, you know, minor alcohol or cigarette use or something like that, right? Um, but they're not putting themselves in a dangerous situation. They're not doing it excessively every weekend. They're not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Am I going to just immediately pick up the phone and call mom and dad and be like, hey, your kid had half a beer last weekend. You need to take care of this. Right? Probably not. Um, why? Well, unless that's a specific focus of the treatment, it probably isn't going to impact the treatment uh, well, and it probably isn't going to impact the relationship very well. Now, I am very upfront with my adolescents and uh, older children clients that, you know, if you're engaging in something that's dangerous. If you are gonna, you know, hurt yourself or someone else, then yeah, we have to make sure that everybody is safe. Uh, but if it's, you know, here's here's who I, you know, have a crush on at school or something like that, and the parents are like, well, who is it that they're wanting to try and date? I'm all, I mean, no, there's no reason for that. Um, I don't know. Did that help answer a little bit of your question, Zach? Yeah, it did. Um, I had a pretty uh, a pretty good idea about it from last semester. We talked about it from there, but um, when it was brought up in the video, I just kind of wanted to press on it. Yeah, and it's you know, and again, it, part of it is that knowing you know what is it that's a clinically relevant behavior versus non relevant, right? Like it doesn't really matter versus oh, this is something that's important for us to address in session. Uh, so if you know, the problem is anorexia and the kid is engaging in behaviors that are consistent with that and are problematic and making them worse, then of course we're going to have to address those, right? They told me that they're purging at school now. Um, so now we have to address that. Whereas if it's, oh, they told me that you know, they got caught you know, smoking a cigarette or a vape or whatever. I think people vape now. Cigarette and vape. Um, you know, they got caught vaping, you know, under the bleachers or something like that. And their parents don't know. You know, is that a huge issue? Well, uh, not in a lot of cases. So my job's not to be a tattletale, right? My job's to be the therapist. So. Dr. Luck, I just want to clarify because I'm seeing a client that is 17 right now. Should it sort of be discussed in a way that unless it's a behavior that is harming you because you know we go over in the consent those things um and unless your parent requests what we're just you know what we're discussing in the records that it's relatively confidential in that sense between her and i yeah i, I think samantha the the best way to talk about it is to say that you know i'm your therapist right um so you know things are confidential between us Unless here's the things that I have to, you know, break confidentiality with. Okay. Talking yourself or other people, putting yourself in dangerous situations, um, you know, behavior that is very clinically relevant and things that we're going to need to address with your parents. But I'm not here, you know, to police your behavior and, you know, make sure that everything you tell me gets told directly to your parents. Okay, because her parent won't be in the session at this point, right? Okay. Um, I mean, it depends on what the problem is, <laughs> and okay. on on the level of support that they're getting from their parents that can help them with their between session assignments and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Kind of makes me think too, like you really have that hour with that with that person with that with their client. And so it really would be kind of hard to know how to manage. Okay. If those, if it becomes a recurring behavior, then yes, I can see where we would need to address it. But if it is something that they feel like they need to bring up, I mean, can you, do you ever explore that with, with your client of like, do you feel like this is a behavior, something that like you're struggling with, or do you feel like 
like, how do you, would you explore it with, with them or unless they like just kind of talk about it to see if you're going to react? I mean, I, which, which I, certainly I, happens I, sometimes, right? Um, so, you know, I think one of the, one of the important things when you're working with adolescents is to keep your formulation in mind, right? Like, where does this information that I'm learning fit in with my conception of what's their problem and how do we, how do we work on it? Um, to me, therapy is not a, hey, you just come in and sit down and like, you know, we just throw some things out there and see what's going on. Uh, that's what friendships are for, right? <laughs> like just getting just that support. Um, now, if someone doesn't have anything like that, right, then that becomes a focus of treatment, right? How do we develop the social skills needed to get, get with friends, to engage with friends, to have that support network? Um, now, certainly that's not what all therapists or all clinicians think, right? Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's less of, hey, let's talk about you know, everything that's going on in your life and more of, okay, let's talk about the reason that you're here and how we can make positive changes to help you not have to be here. Um, and that includes things like, you know, if someone's experimenting with marijuana, okay, well, where are you doing it? How much is it happening? Is it negatively impacting aspects of your life? You know, my guess is, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna have you raise your hands or anything, my guess is most of us probably engaged in ingestion of a substance before it was completely legal for us. Um, you know, uh, I know I did uh, uh, with, with smearing off uh, and things like that, right? So, you know, if I had had a therapist at, at that time uh, and I told them that, would I expect them to run off to my parents? You'd be like, oh my God, Caleb was at the bonfire the other night. Right? He's not 21 yet. Um, he had a couple of drinks and then waited an hour and then he went home. It's like, no, that's, you know, if you're being responsible, it's, it's not my job to be a child. Uh, unless, you know, underage drinking and law breaking was something that you're coming in for because it's a problem. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, we have to address that. Right? Like you're breaking curfew, you're sneaking out, things like that. As opposed to here are norm developmentally normal behaviors you're engaging in. Good questions. Good questions. Well, one of the kind of final nuts and bolts that I want to talk about and go over is okay, well, you're telling me about here's all these things you do in session. But what does session actually look like? Like, what's a therapy session actually look like in cognitive behavioral therapy? So let's talk about what we call session structure. And when I say session structure, I'm talking about kind of just your general template. Um, you know, what is it that I do in a therapy session? Uh, and this is very much a logical order of steps. Um, and kind of the things that you do, but it's not a lockstep process, right? So it's it's um, more cooking and less baking, if you get my drift, right? So, um, you know, when I bake, I generally need to follow the directions exactly. Right? It's like, all right, bake it at 350. Eh, you know what? I want it to bake uh, in half the time. I'll crank it up to 700. That'll be fine, right? No, that's not how chemistry works, it turns out. Um, Cooking is a little, usually a little more loosey goosey. Right? It's like, well, in general, you know, here's what we want to do. But I can put a little bit more spice in if I want, or I can swap this ingredient out because I don't like that. So it's a logical order of things that you do, but it's not something where I, I must do this, then this, then this, then this. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a, a recipe. It's a general guide. Um, and having a, a structure for your therapy session helps to provide direction to what I'm doing. It helps make sure that I'm keeping my focus on what I need to keep it on. And it provides substance in your therapy. And it helps make sure that we are moving towards our goals, whatever those goals happen to be. Um, 
I cannot even tell you all how many clients and patients I've seen across the last two decades who had seen other therapists, counselors, psychologists, uh, and they get to me and I'm like, all right, here's what we're going to be doing. I'm outlining the steps. We're going to be taking a session, making plans. And they're just kind of like, what, what is this? Because they've never had someone who did anything that was even remotely structured. And to them, therapy was coming in, setting down, and the therapist going, well, tell me about your last week. And then they just kind of riff off of that for the rest of the time. But there's no focus, right? There's no overarching plan. And having a, a, a set session structure allows you to make sure that you are focused on that plan and your goals, as opposed to just kind of uh, spinning your wheels in the ruts that you're in. So there are six core components to a good cognitive behavioral therapy session, or I would argue any therapy session. And we'll talk about these individually. Um, steps one through five are generally done in this order, uh, where you do a mood check-in, you review any homework, set your agenda, you do the, the kind of meet the content of your session, and then you assign homework. Step six is something that you do that's kind of a floater, right? You can do it multiple times throughout the session, uh, we do it at the end, but uh, a lot of us do it multiple times throughout the session for a variety of reasons, as we'll see. So the very first thing that I do when I start up a therapy session is I do a mood check-in. Uh, so, for example, yesterday uh, I saw this 11-year-old girl and her parents. Um, when she came in for me, very severe anxiety, trichotillomania, fair amount of oppositional behavior, uh, vomiting three to five times at school per week in order to uh, be sent home. <laughs> lots and lots of things going on, right? Um, now, I've been seeing them since the end of November, roughly every two weeks. Um, it's kind of on average. And at this point, she's, you know, not had any vomiting episodes since the end of the first week that I saw her. Uh, her anxiety is way, way, way down. Her trick is much better. Um, she doesn't have to wear a hat to kind of hide all the patchiness everywhere. Um, she still doesn't have any eyebrows or eyelashes. So that's that's our, our thing we're really working on. Um, but she had had a lot of, the previous time that I saw them, a lot of what I call Apathy, um, you know, sort of looks like depressive symptoms, but maybe not. Um, she was having a lot of that, and they were doing a lot of struggling over schoolwork. Uh, so a lot of fighting about schoolwork, and her grades were, were kind of down in the almost all D's range. So it's been two weeks since I saw them. So the very first thing I do is I open it up with a new check-in. And what that allowed me to do was start getting a baseline on the symptoms. All right, well, tell me about her apathy. Tell me about what's going on with that. Tell me about, has she had any more episodes of vomiting? Okay, what about her trichotillomania? So one of the ways that we track that is actually having to take photographs weekly um, of her, her entire head, uh, all the way around 360. So, okay, let's take a look at those right quick. Right? Let's, let's see what those are. Let's compare them to the week before. Um, and I, I just kind of get an overall idea of what's going on, right? what's going on right now. Um, and that helps me to, you know, one, get baseline information about what the problems are that they're experiencing right now. But it also helps me get them in the reflective idea and mindset. Right. I, as you know, a client, I often will come in and be like, all right, here's what's going on. Right? I just want to talk about what the problem is. Okay, well, let's hold on for a minute. What is it that we've been tracking and working on? Okay, these problems. Let's check in on those. Let's see how they are before, you know, the, the crisis du jour comes up. Um, 
it also allows us to recap last session a little bit. So, okay, well, you know, when you guys, you know, I last saw you, these were the major issues that were being a problem. Um, you know, I had recommended these interventions. We were going to try this. So tell me, how are those things now? It allows you to get a comparison. Right? Like, is there change across time? And this one is really important because, um, you know, I'm seeing someone generally once every week to once every two weeks. They're seeing each other every day. And so it's hard a lot of times for them to see change and progress that's occurred. Um, which is why we do things like check in, um, measures of various symptoms, behavioral measures. Uh, it's one of the reasons I have them do the pictures of her hair uh, to be able to you know, check in on what's going on with that. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, right? You can do it verbally. Right? Well, tell me about your week. What was going on? Um, you can use self-report measures. You can use other report measures. You can use photographs like I'm using. Um, you can do behavioral observations. So when I treat people who have Tourette's and tics, for example, uh, I do frequency counts. Uh, and they don't know that I'm doing it. But I do it but starting the very first session. I do frequency counts. Uh, where for five minutes, twice in each session, I count how many ticks that they're having. Uh, and I keep track of that. And that way I can compare that to the last session and the session before that um, to see, you know, what sort of direct behavioral evidence do I have of change in symptoms. So we do a mood check-in first. How are things going? And one of the really important aspects of doing this is it leads to a, if you do it right, an increased awareness of these core behavioral and cognitive behavioral principles of the connection between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Helps them to distinguish between different mood states or different levels of mood, all of which we know lead to improved treatment outcomes. So better emotional recognition, uh, better ability to articulate the cognitive behavioral therapy model. Um, all of those lead to better outcomes because it allows you to know when to do these interventions that I'm learning about. If I can tell that I'm having this change in my emotional state, I know I apply this thing or I do this action when that's happening, which leads to better outcomes because I'm doing what it is I need. And usually, I then roll right into uh, our homework group. So uh, for this family, for example, uh, I had put them on a token economy system uh, the two weeks beforehand. Um, and we had put all three of their children on it, even though only one of them was the identified client. Um, had put all three of their children on a token economy system to specifically shape up certain behaviors that this uh, identified client uh, was being very apathetic about. Uh, so you know, taking shower, kind of basic hygiene stuff, uh, taking her medication, uh, doing her relaxation exercises that I had started her doing that really, really helped with her anxiety. Um, and then tracking her uh, pulling behaviors, so her hair pulling behaviors. So, yeah, and then we set up ones for the, you know, the, her, her other two siblings as well. Okay, well, let's talk about that token economy system. Here's what we were going to do. Tell me how that's going. Tell me how that's working out. Okay. Um, did you do it? How did it go? What did people think about it? What did the kids think about it? What do you think about it? Um, and what that does is that helps me make sure they know, hey, this is important. Um, just like for you all, if you all turned in a whole bunch of homework and I never graded it, I never talked about it, I never gave you any feedback, you probably wouldn't really enjoy that, right? You'd think, why the hell am I doing this? Um, but instead, I'm checking in. Oh, tell me about the homework. What do you think about the video reviews? Here's some feedback on that. Here's your grades on that. Um, and what's going on there. Right? Um, so for them, it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful check-in because I asked about it. 
and the mom's face just lights up. She's like, I've never, I've, my house has never been this clean. Uh, you know, you wouldn't believe that they're, they're just like falling over themselves to get these tokens. And we haven't even told them what they can earn with the tokens yet. I was like, wait, we, we talked about that's one thing that you really need to do. They're like, yeah, they just know they're going to get something. And they're just, just desperately working as hard as they can to get these tokens. You know? um, so it's working beautifully, which is great. Um, Okay, great. What about the other homework? You know, which for them was tracking um, her her pulling behaviors. Okay, well, that's not going as well. Still a little hard. Da, 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 da. Okay, great. That gives me feedback on, you know, do I need to move forward with what I already planned for session? Do I need to adjust that? What's going on? So maybe they had said something like, well, we actually didn't get to. Oh, okay, well, let's plan it out right now. I will put a pause on it. Let's plan out everything right we need to do, and let's implement that now. So homework review is huge, right? Um, a lot of times when we're giving homework, uh, we, we don't need to call it homework, especially for our adolescents. Uh, let's just, you know, it's, it's our, you know, it's our experiment or it's a project or something like that. Um, because a lot of them have you know, these negative connotations to homework. Um, you know, it's our project that we're using, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we'll still review that with them as well. Um, so, you know, the little six-year-old, last time I saw her, you know, I checked in with her. Okay, well, you were going to do this. How did it go? Right? Tell me about this. And she's six, so it's really more like she's telling me about the last day rather than the last month, right? Um, but I'm still checking in with her so that she knows that it's important, the things that I've been, you know, having her and her parents do. Uh, and then I'll get a, a better view from her parents, but, or a, a bigger view, I should say. So we do a mood check-in, we do a homework review, and then we move into our agenda setting. And the agenda setting is where I, through a, again, collaborative, empirical nature and trying to say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do with the rest of our time. Today. So I'm setting the stage for what we're going to be doing with interventions, with psychoeducation, with whatever it happens to be. And what is on the agenda, how much is on the agenda can vary great, right? So you know, if I've got a six-year-old, you know, 10 minutes with her is, is kind of pushing it uh, for direct sustained attention. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to have a whole lot of time with her. We're going to do a little bit, you know, but then I'm going to spend most of my time with the parents working on, you know, whatever the problem are. I've got a 17 year old, like Samantha was saying, you know, it's probably mostly going to be with that 17 year old. Uh, I'll probably still want to do some checking in with the parents, uh, at least every couple of sessions. Uh, but a lot of that's going to be, you know, focused directly with that 17 year old. And most of your clients that are coming in for therapy, uh, unless they've specifically seen someone else who's doing empirically uh, supported treatments, probably have not had someone set an agenda with them. Um, and so a lot of times they just have this idea that therapy is, I come in here, you ask me how I'm doing, and then we talk. And, and then I leave. But that's not what good cognitive behavioral therapy um, or good you know, evidence-based practice looks like. Uh, but that lack of familiarity with the agenda means that we often need to talk with our clients specifically about agendas and about what the pros and cons of an agenda is. Um, you know, what is it that's good about setting an agenda? Well, it keeps me focused and make sure that we're making progress to our goals what are the cons? What are the, the potential losses? Well, yeah, we may not get to talk about every single thing that you want to that happened last week. Um, you know, we may have to focus in on a few specific things. And, you know, that's okay. We can always, you know, get to it next time. But you want to elicit, you know, what what does this mean for them? Because um, I've had... I've definitely had people be very resistant to the idea of an agenda in therapy. Um, usually not by the, you know, 
second, third, fourth session. Um, but up front, it's like, whoa, I thought, I'm, I thought this was my time. Right? Like, this is my time to talk. Well, you can, but that's what you've been doing with this other therapist. How did that go? Right? Like, like, was that effective, just going and talking? Or do we maybe need to do something else? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm seeing this uh, 23, 24 year old right now who had been in therapy for a decade before she came to see me you know, with the same person uh, and had not really had much, if any, progress in a decade of doing therapy. And so when I started talking to her about, all right, you know, here's my conceptualization of what's going on, here's my treatment plan, all right, we'll be doing these sort of things in sessions, you know, we'll be setting the agenda in each session, she was kind of like, what? <laughs> what? What is this? Like, I've never, I've never encountered these things before. Is this what therapy is supposed to look like? I thought it was just I talked, and then you talked, and you said, oh my gosh, tell me more about that. But no, that's not what's going to happen here. We're going to get some shit done. Um, so, you know, they, they were very excited about that, uh, partially because of the problems that brought them in, which are things like perfectionism and uh, very high anxiety. So they're like, okay, yes, I can do the best that I can in therapy. I can be the best in therapy. And it's like, well, hold on. Like, we may purposely fail some uh, just to teach you that it's okay. But, you know, things like that can certainly um, scare some people. Um, I've had some of my supervisees in the past who've seen clients up here in our clinic who are older, uh, kind of habitual, you know, therapy users. Um, and they were not very happy about things like agendas. And it was like, no, I came in here to talk. So I just want you to listen to me talk for the next 50 minutes. Like, well, I mean, we could do that, but it's probably not going to help you much, right? Like, that's probably not going to help you solve the problems you're experiencing. Um, so let me tell you what I think might help, and let's see how you respond to that. And so, you know, for them, one of the things we did was we carved aside, like, the last 10 minutes, each session, whatever it is that she wanted to talk about, right? Like, we made that part of the agenda, um, is that, you know, we'll work on our specific goals and progressing, and in the last 10 minutes, whatever it is that you want to talk about. Uh, so, you know, setting your agenda is also about compromise. Uh, you know, what is it that they want to dis discuss and talk about? So after you set your agenda, then you address those items on your agenda. And that's what we call our session content. This is usually the bulk of your sessions. This is the majority of what's going on. Um, and it's where you start kind of juggling because you are trying to juggle the structure, right? What, what is it that I am doing in order to help someone become better at this task, become you know, more effective at this, you know, decrease this behavior, so you're doing that. But at the same time, you are trying to pay attention to content, right? So what is it that I'm giving them and how are they responding to? How are the tasks, how are my agenda items that I'm doing things, um, what is it that's being elicited there? What reactions and response are you having? Uh, and so paying attention to that. And then at the same time, paying attention to the process. Um, how are they responding to that content that's being elicited? How are they responding to the structure of you know, the interventions that we're teaching them, the skills that we're teaching them there? that we're doing with them, um, you know, how are they responding to that? So you've got these kind of these three balls that you're juggling, right, and trying to keep all of them moving it up in the air so that you don't drop it. Right? And this is often the, the trickiest part for new clinicians, is making sure that I'm not just focused on, all right, I'm teaching you this skill, right? It's like I'm not just focused on that, I'm doing that, but I'm also paying attention to, okay, well, what are they experiencing, right? Um, what's going on inside you know, their heads, what's going on in terms of emotions, what's going on in terms of the behavior. 
So the session content varies a lot. You'll see an enormous amount of it across the workshops right, in terms of what we do with it. And then we wrap up by looking at okay, what's our homework assignment? Um, you know, what is it that I'm going to have you then do between now and next session to help continue the progress that we made here? Um, I know on the first video, um, Bruce talked about, you know, you're with me for an hour and you're with you for 167 hours between now and next time I see you. So if I don't have you doing anything, that's a really big waste of time. So I'm going to keep therapy going through assigning homework um, and making sure that it's very meaningful, right? That it's it's personalized and that it's very much reflective of what we just talked about in session. I'm not going to spend all session doing cognitive restructuring and then give you homework for relaxation. No, I would give you homework related to what we talked about in session. Right? Just like you know, we wouldn't spend all session or all class talking about um, algebra, and then I tell you to go write an essay on Bigfoot, right? Like, we're going, what, wait, where did that come from? Um, that's ridiculous. Um, so, your homework flows from your session content, uh, and we're going to see huge amounts of that throughout the semester in our workshop. And then we have our sixth aspect here, which is eliciting feedback. And this is something that can happen at any point or at multiple points during the session. Um, so I will often elicit feedback when I'm explaining new concepts or ideas. Uh, when I'm talking about new tasks or new interventions, I'll ask for feedback about that. I'll ask for feedback about um, the homework assignments. I'll ask for feedback about how this session went. So there's enormous amounts of ways that you can elicit that feedback and multiple times you can do so throughout. Right? So this is kind of a floater, right? Like it happens all throughout the session. Um, one of the things that's really, really important and that the collaborative uh, aspect of CBT is based on is your clients feeling that it's okay to give you feedback positive and negative, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I will often make very explicit is that if I'm saying something and it doesn't make sense, you need to tell me because sometimes my words don't come out right. right. Or, you know, if we're working on something and you don't like it um, and it doesn't fit with what you think is going to help, tell me that so that we can address that. Um, if something goes well, let me know. If something doesn't go well, let me know. Uh, and this helps to really solidify that therapeutic alliance, which allows you to then have a stronger chance of them being able to do what it is that you're asking them to do. This also can help with your case conceptualization. Um, if someone is having specific cognitive difficulties, that might be related to what they're experiencing in their everyday life. Right? They, they keep missing things or something's really difficult for them to understand and grasp. Um, or they're engaging in behaviors in session that are problematic and probably reflective of what they're doing outside of session. You know, tell us about that. Let us know. Because that helps me to say, oh, okay, like they're being a real jackass right now with me. They're probably doing that outside of here as well, right? So what does that mean, right? What would that look like? How would that impact my understanding of what's going on with them? Because there's a really good chance for all of you that you're going to have a student, a client, a patient, where you're like, I don't really like them. Like, like I don't really like them much. I'd rather they can't. Right, and a number of you have probably already had that. <laughs> um, and what's important then is to stop and say, okay, why am I having this reaction? Right? What is it about what's going on that's making me have this reaction? How does that help me understand how other people are responding to them? Which helps me understand how their environment is helping to shape or not shape their behavior. Which gives me a better idea of 
what's going on with them in terms of our conceptualization and our understanding, and also probably increases my empathy, like we talked about. Where, okay, yeah, like, no wonder mom and dad are so frustrated, right? Like, like I get it. Um, or no wonder, you know, the teacher is struggling with this particular student. Like, yeah, they're kind of hard to get along with. Um, so, but a lot of that you get through this, you know, uh, elicitation of feedback. So, session structure is incredibly important. It helps you as the therapist and it helps your clients, right? And what does it help you do? It helps you meet your goals and keeps progress going forward in therapy because it is incredibly easy to veer off with a lot of these clients um, where, you know, they've got what I call CLD or crazy life disorder. Uh, and there's always something new, right? Like every week, there's something new going on. And it feels like that's what we need to address, right? Like, oh my gosh, this is a crisis, right? It's our crisis of the week. We got to take care of this. But every week they come in with a crisis of the week. And if I don't have a good treatment plan in place, a good understanding of what's going on with them, and then session structure, then it's really easy to follow that off on a path that leads us to no progress. Instead of keeping our eye on, oh, okay, here's the problem. Here's what we need to do to treat the problem. Okay, we'll keep moving forward. Yeah, that sounds really bad. But what you know is that each week that crisis is happening because of the same core problem. It's the same pathological process that's occurring that's causing these crises each week. So if we don't address that, they're always going to happen. I often use the metaphor of uh, an arsonist. Let's say that there's a rash of fire settings here in Edmond. Right? Uh, and the, the fire department are just going from house to house to house. You know, fires are being set. Houses are ablaze. And they just keep doing that. And they just keep going and putting the fire out. Go over here, put the fire out. Go over here, put the fire out. They could keep doing that forever. Or we could actually find out who's catching the fire, or starting the fires, catch them. And then all of a sudden, now we're not having those fires. So should I focus on putting all the flames out? Or maybe should I focus on who's starting the flames in the first place? Now, that doesn't mean that you just let flames go all the time. Right? But that means that you keep in mind what's causing this. And that comes from your conceptualization. And that session structure helps make sure that you stay on track. So thoughts about session structure, concerns, comments, what we got? No, no, you like things that are structured. That's fine. Thanks. No, I think I think that um, this makes sense, especially thinking about littles. Um, like, just they need that focus. They need that structure. Um, and for since you would be collaborating with the parents, the parents already have so many things on their plate that, you know, just providing this simple out or this kind of outline or easily just giving them this kind of homework can help them focus and on the target, um, ultimately the goal. Um, I liked how you mentioned, you know, if you do have someone coming in and wanting to just word vomit all their issues, like trying to get back on track and saying, well, at the end of session, let's set some time aside to discuss that. I think that that shows that you are listening to them and that you do care about that, but that you are also still honoring why they're there in the first place and the ultimate goal. So I that to me made a lot of sense. And um, I can see that being very important to use. Yeah, because you don't want to dismiss that. Right, like that could be very relevant to why they're coming to therapy in the first place. Right, they don't have other social supports to draw from. Uh, but if you just make yourself that sole social support, you're not really benefiting them. Right, like you're actually doing them a massive disservice uh, because you could be helping them to increase their quality of life as opposed to just making them uh, 
dependent upon you. All right, what else? What else we got? Questions right now. When you talked about the uh, constant crisis and coming in with a new crisis, it made me think of the personality issues. And I know that those aren't diagnosable. Uh, yeah, so um, in terms of treating the, what we used to call kind of the access to problems with personality disorders, um, we do have treatments for specific ones. So for example, um, dialectical behavior therapy was originally developed specifically for working with people who have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Um, so, you know, they are really good examples of there's always something going on and there's always some sort of crisis. But if we just address the crises, we don't address the actual problem. Right? And although we don't necessarily diagnose personality disorders in youth, and adolescents, we can see that same sort of thing within the family systems a lot of times, right? Where there's just this ongoing crisis, right? Um, oh, you won't believe what they did this week, right? Or here's the problematic behavior that they showed this week. Or here's what they got in trouble for at school this week. And so it's still this kind of constant ongoing crisis, but it almost inevitably has a very specific reason it's occurring. And so if we can figure out what that reason is, then we can actually address it, right? And we can treat it effectively as opposed to uh, just stamping out the fires every time that they pop up. So same sort of thing for sure. Uh, we see that a lot with uh, oppositional uh, defiant disorder or cognitive disorder diagnosis for sure. What else we got? Other questions or thoughts? No? I have one. Um, something I was just curious about um, regarding the homework and you're talking about getting that feedback from them. And you may have already addressed this. I'm just forgetting. Um, when you, if you start noticing that the client is showing signs of reluctancy or not just straight up not doing their homework. So obviously as a therapist, you think I need, may need to make some modifications and use this as some feedback and just kind of just put it out there, say, well, why do you think this isn't working? Like, is this something that like, do you just not want to do it? Do you feel like maybe there's something else we need to be doing to help you? I mean, do you give it like two strike, like two sessions and then they're still not doing it. So on the third session, you're like, okay, now let's really address this. Or are you make, constantly making those tweaks along the way? Yeah, I think it, it's more of a constant thing. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to um, get feedback about one, what's going on with them first, if they were to check in, and two, how did the homework go? Because if they, let's say for example, didn't engage in any of the homework, well, then I'm not going to do what I had planned for session, right? Because it builds every week upon the previous things that we did, right? So um, I just kind of put that aside and say, okay, well, let's problem solve why it was that you had such a problem doing this particular homework or assignment or whatever it was. Or maybe you did it, but it didn't go well, right? Um, okay, what was it that was the issue? Um, maybe maybe you as a therapist didn't give them great instructions, right? Maybe they as the client got great instructions, but it didn't get in there, right? And so they didn't actually do what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so it's, it's really, it's more this kind of constant thing where I'm checking whether or not you're learning these skills because it's only after you've learned this and got this done that we can then move on to the next one. Um, and so, you know, it's very much... If you look at the manuals, right, it's like here's session one, here's session two, here's session three, which are a general guideline, right? Because if, if we do what we do in session two, but they don't do their homework and they're not getting that skill or that idea or that concept, well, we're not just going to move to session three and skip it, right? We're going to 
we do session two, problem solve what it was that they were struggling with, and then reassign that homework, uh, as opposed to just like, which I see all the time, um, therapists who like throw out, here's something to do, here's something to try. And then they never mention it again, and they just throw out something random the next time. Um, you see that a lot of times when people don't have a plan, right? they don't actually have a treatment plan, and they're just kind of making things up as they go. You know, with, with us having good structured, you know, ideas of what is it that we need someone to know, step one, step two, step three, step four, that allows us to check in every time and actually make sure that they're doing that before we then try it. I have a question. So what do you do, um, say you have an adolescent that is being ordered to go to this therapy? Will this work with them? I mean, if they're just like, I don't want to be here. This homework stuff is stupid. I mean, does it work? I mean, do you just continue to work with them or how does that look? Yeah, great question. Great question, Marcy. Uh, I couldn't tell who was speaking at first, by the way, and it came up and said Cameron, and I was like, who the hell is Cameron? I don't know why it's saying that's my son. Somehow he's like got on my computer. I don't know. <laughs> it's <me> though. <laughs> I was just very confused uh, at first, but yeah, so not infrequently, we have children who are being brought into therapy, not of their own volition, right? Um, and so whether that's a younger child or whether that's an adolescent or whether that's someone who's being ordered to come in for treatment, um, generally there's very low motivation at first to be there, right? Or to do the homework assignments. So, that's part of your job is figuring out, okay, well, what's their level of motivation and how can we make that better? So a lot of times, you know, I'll kind of fall back on a general strategy of like, yeah, you don't want to be here, but you have to be here. So we can either fight each other the entire you know, time, or we can try and figure out what is it that you want to do with your time here that we can do effectively. Um, or I can engage in motivational interviewing strategies if needed in order to get them uh, kind of shifted up into a uh, stage of change where they're ready to actually do something. Um, or maybe that just means that there's now an external thing uh, hanging over. Okay, well, you were ordered to do eight sessions. Um, and we can do eight sessions where you sit there and say nothing. Uh, or we can, you know, do the eight sessions where we actually, you know, do some work, which means you won't have to do another eight sessions because you didn't do anything this first month. So, so finding that motivator is really key. And that can be an external motivator, that can be an internal motivator, uh, but finding that and then leveraging that is not honestly too different from any other clients um, that we have come in because we will very frequently have clients come in who are not doing so purely because they want to do it. Good questions, good questions. 